morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. Good to see the church so full. This week, this Sunday, rather, we are switching to a new sermon series, or I don't think we call them sermon series, worship series, uh, for the next few weeks entitled Sound Bites. When we consider how, uh, how we gather our news, how journalists want to grab headlines, grab attention with their news, they're looking for little sound bites, little statements by the important people in our world that they can maybe twist a little bit, that they can use to their advantage, that they can interpret any way they want. And from that speaker's point of view, maybe they want to be able to say a, just a very little as well. They want to be able to back out of what they said. They want to be able to have what they said reinterpreted in the event that it goes sour. When we look at the way Jesus speaks, sometimes he says very little. Sometimes he says a lot. But whatever he's doing, whether he says a little or a lot, he's always seeking to say something meaningful. Not something that he can back out of. Not something that he wants to be reinterpreted. But he wants to say something that matters to you that has an effect on your life, and that fills you up with the meaning that he seeks to bring. That's our worship series uh, for this, that's our, uh, sorry, that's our worship theme for today, and we'll begin on page four with our opening hymn. God bless your worship. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his holy life and innocent death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for this morning comes from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, and it will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
We continue with our Psalm of the Day, Psalm 23. Doing it a little different this week. We'll have one refrain that we'll sing at the beginning. We will read the psalm responsively, and then we'll sing a second different refrain at the end. shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading for this morning comes from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13. Regardless of how many bad shepherds are, shepherds are out there, and there are many, God declares that all of them will have to give an account for their work and for how they have taken care of the flock of God. And that's an impossible task for sinful men to accomplish, at least well. And yet we find out here that it is God himself who commands the shepherds to go out and give an accounting who also equips them to do that work ably. We read, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. gospel for this morning comes from Mark's account, chapter 6, where we see that the inconsiderate crowds that so often harassed and hounded Jesus wherever he went, they had little concern 
for Jesus' time or Jesus' comfort or even Jesus' message oftentimes. Nevertheless, Jesus looked at them and saw them as lost and wandering people who needed a shepherd, and that moved him to compassion to help them. We read, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
The word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is written in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23. In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Recently, I listened to an interview that involved a woman by the name of Yomni Park. Yomni Park grew up in North Korea under the regime of Kim Jong-il. From her childhood, she recalls how regularly dead bodies, people who had died from starvation, were just kind of lining the street in the town where she lived. She recalls eating things like grasshoppers and dragonflies just to get a little bit of protein in her diet. She recalls being forced to work for the government in collecting feces, both from animals and from human beings, because it was the only source of fertilizer that they had. And perhaps worst of all, growing up, she had no idea that anybody else on planet Earth had it any better than she did. Because, of course, all of the information that she was ever allowed to see or read or hear was carefully controlled by the government who oppressed her. At the age of 13, Yeomni Park and her mother successfully escaped North Korea and went to China. Unfortunately, that escape was facilitated by human traffickers, and so she was just trading in one form of slavery for another. Thankfully, however, she eventually escaped China as well, and now she lives in America. She's still just 27 years old. She has a degree now from Columbia University. She's a published author and is a very outspoken activist against the North Korean regime. Now, out of all the details that caught my attention as I listened to that interview, out of all the details of her story that were very sad and very tragic, one especially stuck out in my mind. You see, while Ms. Park and her mother were in China, they came across some Chinese Christian missionaries who were there. They regularly met with them and went to their Bible studies. And yet she recalls at one point that the pastor who led that group told her that because of things that she had done, because of things she had really been forced to do while in slavery under threat of her life, she was so sinful that she could never be forgiven. She was so dirty that she could never be made clean. Now, my point in telling you that story this morning is not so much to get you to think a certain way about an evil North Korean dictator. It's not so much to get you to think a certain way about a pastor who would actually withhold from someone the very thing that he is supposed to freely dispense. Instead, my reason for mentioning that story is to ask you this important question. What in the world are we supposed to make of a God who would give authority to both of those people in the first place? As Americans, it comes pretty natural for us to be skeptical of authority, certainly authority that is highly concentrated and localized in one or a few people. Our entire nation is built on the principle that authority needs to be dispersed. Our founding fathers established three branches of government. In our country, authority is separated and powers are limited among those three branches and there are checks and balances among those three branches. And as Americans, who are of course also Christians, it's very easy for us to think of our faith in sort of similar terms. There are, of course, those people who say that they want to be spiritual without being religious, which is sort of just another way of saying, I don't want anyone to be in charge of my soul other than me. And even pe for people who regularly go to church, the idea that that church or that the spiritual leaders within that church have actual authority over their souls is an idea that it, at the very least, is unfamiliar to many and probably raises a few eyebrows, to say the least. And when you consider the history of both political leaders and spiritual leaders that have existed in our world and even in our country, that's no surprise. So back to the question, why does God continue to give that authority to people? Why doesn't he just do what our founding fathers did? Why doesn't he just take that authority and spread it out, disperse it, dilute it as much as possible. As we look at the verses that are in front of us this morning, we're going to see that God does just the opposite. These verses tell us how God deals with bad leaders. 
And as we look at these verses this morning, we're going to see that the way God does that is not the American way. It's not the way that we would probably do it. As we look at these verses, we're going to see that God's solution to bad leadership is more leadership, not less. The leaders in question in these verses are what we would call kings. But keep in mind that in the ancient Near East, including among God's people Israel, kings were not just political leaders, they were also spiritual leaders too. They were really responsible for the total care of the people that they ruled. And so it's no wonder that in the ancient Near East, those kings were often referred to as shepherds. The implication being that the people they ruled were the sheep of their flock. Well, for God's people Israel, they had had a string of very bad shepherds. Basically, since King David, Israel's greatest king, it's, it had sort of been more or less all downhill from there. And so as a result, the worst possible thing that could possibly happen to sheep was happening to them. They were being scattered. They were being sent into exile in Babylon. And so in these verses through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord wants those very bad leaders to know that they have it coming. That even though they haven't been paying attention to the needs of the people that they serve, God has very much been paying attention to them. And he is going to punish them. He is going to take their authority away. And he was going to bring back, he was going to regather the flock of sheep that they were responsible for scattering. But then notice what happens next. After that scattered flock was back together, Jeremiah says this. I will place shepherds over them. So the Lord takes away the authority from those bad shepherds, but then, then he replaces them. He gives that very same authority to other shepherds. God's solution to bad leadership is not to eliminate leadership altogether. It's not less leadership. It's actually more. Now, in our day and age, authority looks a little bit different. For starters, we don't have a king or a queen. And even beyond that, we sort of separate political leaders from religious leaders. We separate those two things. And not only that, but the only system that you and I are really familiar with, that we've ever grown up with, is one where we get to actually have an active role in choosing those leaders. We get to vote for which political leaders we're going to have. We get to choose which church we're going to join and therefore what spiritual leaders we are going to have. And because we have such an active role in choosing our leaders, the impression is very quickly given that we could just as easily choose to have no leaders at all. Now, I'm by no means saying that it's a bad thing that we get to vote in our country or that church membership in our country is a voluntary thing. But very easily, the impression can be given that the reason that those political leaders or those spiritual leaders have authority is because they got it from us. Because we chose, we decided to willingly give it to them. And in the process, it's very easy for us to ignore what the Bible clearly says, that both with political leaders and with spiritual leaders, their authority has been given to them by God. It's also very easy for us to ignore what the Bible very clearly says about us. God gives us shepherds, well, because we are sheep. Contrary to what we might like to believe about ourselves, we cannot provide everything that we need for body and soul all by ourselves. We need to be a part of communities and societies, and we need leaders in those places. We also need to be a part of churches, and we need leaders in those places too. And so a situation where an individual would be existing, sort of out there all by themselves with absolutely no authority in their life, with no one to answer to in all the world except themselves, that's not some utopian ideal of what freedom or liberty looks like. Again, it is the worst possible thing for a sheep to be scattered from, from its flock and to be scattered from its shepherd. And so that's why you heard Mark tell us Jesus did what he did when he saw that flock of sheep that had been scattered from its flock and from its shepherd. Jesus didn't applaud them. Jesus didn't commend them. Jesus had compassion on them. This was a problem that needed to be addressed. This was a situation that needed to be solved. 
Now, it's another sermon for another day to talk a little bit about what the Bible also says to both those political and those spiritual leaders that God gives authority to. It's another sermon for another day to talk about the standards that he holds them to and the warnings that he gives them if they would neglect or if they would abuse the authority that they have been given. At the very least, these verses from Jeremiah show us that when there are bad leaders, God by no means turns a blind eye to that fact. But at the very same time, he does not eliminate leaders from people's lives altogether. Instead, he takes those bad leaders, he takes their power away from them, but then he replaces them with other leaders. Once again, God's solution to bad leadership is not less leadership, but more. So where does that then leave us? It would seem to put us in a situation similar to the one that God's people were in. You get one bad leader, God takes his power away from him, God replaces him with someone else, but then that next leader is just as bad as the one who came before him. Round and round it goes. If God is so committed to replacing bad leaders with more leaders, it would seem that we are destined to be stuck in that vicious cycle. But what if that's kind of the point? What if part of what God is doing in being so committed to replacing bad leaders with more leaders is to teach us that leaders, as much as they are intended to be a blessing in our life, cannot possibly be the ultimate shepherd that we need. That none of them, no matter how good they might be, cannot possibly provide the totality of the care that we need as sheep. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? As much as we as Americans are skeptical of authority, as much as we like to to think that we want to keep as much authority and as much power in our own hands as we possibly can, how quickly we are to idolize certain leaders, to give them heroic, messianic, divine powers almost, as if no matter what the problem might be, they can solve it as long as we put them in control. What if God is trying to teach us not to do that, not to put our trust in human leaders? If by continually replacing bad leaders with more leaders, even the best of which have tons and tons of flaws, what if God is teaching us to keep looking for the real leader that we need? That as he replaces bad leaders with more leaders, he's teaching us to look for the one leader who can truly be called good. Because, of course, God's plan all along was to send us a leader just like that. Jeremiah says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. So David's royal family line was going to be reduced to a stump. Bad leader after bad leader would teach the people not to trust even in the greatest of kings. But then God promised that from that dead and lifeless stump, a branch would shoot forth. A king would come. And that promised king, our good shepherd Jesus, was to be given authority over every single facet of our lives. Our physical lives, our spiritual lives too. He would be in charge of all of it, and he would use that authority well. Not necessarily how we would. Not necessarily how we often tell him to. Not necessarily in a way that makes sense or seems to be fair to us, but well, wisely, rightly, and justly. In fact, this coming king would even be in charge of the area of our life where we are most reluctant to give control to anyone else. One of the other fascinating details about hearing the story of Yeomni Park was hearing about North Korea's system of collective guilt. In North Korea, if you commit a crime, Not only can you be punished for that, but so can your parents, so can your siblings, so can your children. 
It's one of the ways that that evil regime keeps total control over people's lives. Even if you have done nothing wrong, no doubt they can dig up some sort of crime by some long-dead relative and punish you anyway. Taking your guilt or taking your innocence and putting it in the control of somebody else seems to be about the most inhumane thing possible. It runs contrary to every idea that we have about liberty and human rights. And yet it is exactly what God promises to do with the king that he intended to send. Jeremiah tells us that this king would have a name. His name would be the Lord, our righteousness. Our righteousness, our guilt, or our innocence is the area of our life where we are least willing, most reluctant to give control to anyone else, and yet God makes it clear that this coming king would have authority over that area of our life too. Only he would use that authority again well, wisely, and justly. He would use that authority not to assign us guilt even when we are innocent. Instead, he would use that authority to assign us innocence even though we are so guilty. Jesus would come to live a perfect life, not for himself, but for us. He would come to pay the punishment, not for his own sins, but for the sins of the whole world. He would come to be righteous so that he could then offer that righteousness as a completely free gift to us. And in fact, one of the, the neatest details about these verses is one that's found in just a, a teeny tiny little detail of the text. In fact, one that's kind of hidden in our English translations. Jeremiah tells us that the name of this coming king, the Lord our righteousness, would not just be the name that God would give that king, it would also be the name by which people would call him. In other words, the very same people who are so skeptical of authority, the very same people who are so reluctant to let their guilt or their innocence be in the possession of someone else would willingly, would joyfully call this king the Lord our righteousness. When God replaces bad leaders with more leaders, it forces them to keep looking for the one leader who can truly be called good and in Jesus that search comes to an end. In Jesus we have that leader we need. And when you have found him, once we have found him, you'll be willing to follow him wherever he leads. Over the next few weeks as we continue this sermon series that's entitled Sound Bites, we're going to be hearing some of the things that Jesus, our good shepherd, says to us. As is often the case with Jesus, some of the things that we're going to hear sound a little bit perplexing, a little bit challenging to us, a little bit as if they are going to make our lives more difficult if we listen to the things that Jesus says. And yet these words that Jesus speaks, these are sort of like the food that Jesus, our good shepherd, wants us to graze on. And so as we hear those words over the course of the next several weeks, remember what we are hearing today. That Jesus is this king. That Jesus is our good shepherd. And as our good shepherd, he came to take all of our guilt and to give us all of his righteousness. In other words, he has proven that he can be trusted with our righteousness, the most valuable possession that we possess. And if Jesus can be trusted with our righteousness, you better believe he can be trusted with everything else too. Amen. Please stand. Join with me as we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for your compassion shown in Christ Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and the righteous son of David. Keep us trusting at all times in your right hand, in whom true satisfaction is found. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you have brought us from many families into the household of God. Continue to bless all Christian homes, that fathers and mothers may faithfully lead their children by word and deed to call upon you as Father. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for our nation and its leaders. We ask your blessing on those who serve in civil office, that we may enjoy good government in accord with your commandments. Help us to live in service to our neighbors while here, mindful that our true citizenship is in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning, whether that's in person or online. If you'd like to take the next few moments to let us know you were here, you can do so at goodnewslc.org connect, or you can scan the little QR code on the back of the worship folder. And if you'd like to support our ministry with an offering, you can do so at goodnewslc.org give. Thank you. Please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them, to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God, our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. may be seated. All things are now prepared at the table of the Lord. Please come forward at the direction of the usher.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Be of good cheer for your sins have been forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God, the Father, source of all goodness, in love you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
once again, good morning and welcome to you all. What a blessing to be here in God's house with you today. Everyone's invited to stick around for a bit for fellowship and refreshments. I know the, uh, the aroma that is up on the street as you walked in with the ribs and the pretzels is enticing. But if you need an appetizer before that, we've got bananas and donuts and coffee. So please, uh, by all means, help yourself to those. Stick around and, and chat with folks for a bit. We are scheduled this morning to have our quarterly congregational meeting. This July meeting is actually sort of our annual business meeting where we uh, finalize our ministry plan and budget for the coming year as well as approve nominations for various uh, church council positions, both due to the fact that, as I'm sure you've noticed, it remains a bit stuffy in here. Um, and our apologies for that. The building manager is doing the best he can to try and figure out how to get access to that remote system so that we can actually have control over the temperature in here. But both due to the heat uh, and due to the fact that Art Fair is going on up there and parking spots are at a premium for people who want to go to the fair. And right now we're taking up about 35 to 40 of those among us uh, up there. We are going to truncate our schedule a bit this morning. So we're not going to do Sunday school and Bible study right after church. Instead, we're going to have our meeting uh, right after church. So starting at about 10, 15, we'll get rolling with that and hopefully wrap up uh, in about 60 to 75 minutes with that. So certainly everyone's invited to stick around. Speaking of art fair, a uh, big thank you to all those who helped with our collaborative kids mural yesterday that we did at the art fair. If you didn't happen to notice, uh, make sure you check it out on the way out today. Take a left out the front doors and right along the, the wall of our building facing First Street, there is uh, the mural is hanging there. Um, and so you'll see what the kids who were at the art fair yesterday helped us do. Special thanks to Sarah Wisner and Hannah Aerosmith who helped with uh, the planning and prep work for that mural. Then the other thing I wanted to, to quickly note is that uh, Taste of Mount Horeb is coming up in the very near future. For those of you uh, who have been around for a bit, we started this event two years ago as a, a community block party that sort of features some of the, the great stuff that Mount Horeb has to offer, especially in the realm of food and beverage vendors. Last year, obviously, we didn't do, uh, didn't, didn't do it, as uh, was the case with a lot of things. This year, the event is actually combined with an organization or uh, an event called National Night Out, which is aimed at building police community partnerships. So it's kind of uh, an attempt to help uh, with our police department just build relationships within the community. So it's kind of those dual things together. Two ways you can participate. One is that we have yard signs for that event out in the entryway as you exit. If you'd like to take one and put it up in your front yard or somewhere else around town to help get the word out about the event, that would be great. And then second of all, we'll need some volunteer help at the event, just welcoming people as they arrive, being at the, the Good News booth that we'll have at the event. There's a sign-up sheet for that on the table in the entryway as well. And then last but not least, those of you who are members here at Good News maybe noticed that yesterday evening you got an email from Vicar Aerosmith. Uh, as hard as it is to believe, Vicar Aerosmith's time with us is quickly winding down. Uh, his last Sunday is going to be Sunday, August 8th. Yeah, so three more weeks. Uh, the good news is Vicar Aerosmith gets to preach for all three of those weeks, so he's going to find out what, uh, what that's what that's like. He will uh, certainly be up to the task. But the email announced uh, Vicar's intentions not to continue with his studies to be a pastor by returning to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary next year. So at least for the, the time being, he's going to pursue other things. Um, he kind of went into a little bit of an explanation in that email, but I'll allow him, uh, invite him to make any additional comments he wants to make this morning. Just a, Yeah, just as a, a bit of explanation, I want to declare that I'm not being fired. <laughs> Um, this was this was uh, a prayerful decision made by me and, and Hannah. Um, you know, the, the you spend seven years um, or six years rather preparing. You know, just leading up to this this vicar year, and in those years, you really learn to fall in love with the Word of God, to learn how to interpret, how to really read it and appreciate it, and, and gain a, a, a desire to share that with other people. And then vicar year, you get you really get thrown into the into the trenches, I guess. You get to really apply everything you've learned, and yet there's so much that you can't learn out of a book. You know, that and, and the way I've been putting it um, the past few weeks, at least in my mind, and maybe to a few of you who, who have known, is that there's a difference between being a pastor and being a preacher, or at least there's more to being a pastor than being a preacher. Um, and I think that God has given me many talents and, and skills and aptitudes that lend themselves to ministry 
And yet, you know, the content that we, that we read about today from Jeremiah, from Hebrews, even from Mark, tells us that there's a, there's a very personal aspect to this, that you're not just someone who stands in a pulpit and talks, you're a shepherd. And, you know, over this year, I've, like I said in the email, I, I've come to be, to, to appreciate the friendship and, and, gratit- and generosity that you guys have shown me. And just as much as I've fallen in love with the word, I love you guys too. And, you know, as I think about it, I just love you guys too much to, to put you in the hands of somebody who's not prepared to do this. Um, I appreciate all the, the love and, and care and friendship that you've shown me, and I look forward to serving you for these next three weeks. Um, that's about everything. So I hope if you have any questions or, or comments on the way out, feel free to make them. <laughs> but don't hold up the line. All right. <laughs> Thank you.